is part two of a two-part series on angiogenesis and imaging the microvasculature. I can see some familiar names uh, from the last webinar. Before we start, here is some housekeeping information. Today's webinar is recorded and will be made available uh, at the, as a follow-up. All lines for this webinar will be muted. Uh, and please uh, t make use of the chat window at the right of your WebEx screen for questions. We encourage questions during the webinar. However, all questions, uh, if possible, will be answered towards the end. The expected duration of the presentation is 45 minutes with 10 to 15 minutes for uh, questions. Today we are actually joined by uh, Dr. Alexandra Eichten, who comes from Regeneron Pharmaceuticals uh, in New York. She is a senior staff scientist in the Oncology and Angiogenesis Group. She received her PhD um, at uh, the Harvard Medical School, and her postdoctoral fellowship was on uh, microenvironmental regulation of tumor progression in the um, esteemed laboratory of Dr. Lisa Cousins at the University of California, San Francisco. Today, she will be sharing her scientific findings on the efficacy of Regeneron's cancer drug with a focus on microvasculature assessment comparing contrast enhanced ultrasound and immunohistochemistry, and she will enlighten us on how to establish a liver metastasis model using ultrasound image guidance. Alexandra, at this point, I'd hand over the presentation rights to you, and while you get set up, I ask the audience if you have attended part one of the uh, webinar, please type in your chat window, part one. Hey, Alexandra, are you there? Yes. Wonderful. Alexandra, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mina, for the introduction. So, um, as mentioned before, I will be speaking about our efforts in utilizing non-invasive imaging modalities to assess the effects of VEGF blockade in tumors. So I'll start out with um, a little bit of background. During the development and growth of a tumor, nearby blood vessels initially provide oxygen and nutrients and remove waste products from the tumor site. But uh, once a tumor reaches a certain size, the surrounding blood vessels will not be sufficient anymore and more nutrients and oxygen is needed. When this happens, the tumor cells release factors that promote the growth of new blood vessels, a process called angiogenesis. In solid tumors, the occurrence of angiogenesis is a mandatory event to support tumor growth. The most important angiogenesis-promoting factor is vascular endothelial um, growth factor, or VEGF. When VEGF is released, it causes the endothelial cell, which compose the blood vessels, to divide and migrate into the tumor and form a new blood vessel network. A little bit more background on that. Um, it is a part of a larger family, which consists of five secreted ligands, VEGF-A, VEGF-B, VEGF-C, VEGF-E, and uh, the central growth factor, or PLIGF. Three different receptors, VEGF receptor 1, VEGF receptor 2, and VEGF R3, and two co-receptors, neuropillin 1 and 2. VEGF R1 and 2 um, are expressed on blood vessel endothelial cells, while VEGF receptor 3 is mainly expressed on lymphatic endothelial cells. And as shown in this schematic, um, ligand binding to the respective re receptors results in receptor phosphorylation, which then promotes endothelial cell proliferation and migration and subsequent angiogenesis. Or if signaling to the lymphatic endothelial cells, it results in a process called lymph angiogenesis. Of the five ligands, VEGF-A is the best characterized and the most potent proangiogenic ligand. Its receptor, or its major receptor, is VEGF-R2, which is exclusively expressed on endothelial cells of the blood vasculature. 
Binding of VEGF to VEGFR2 promotes both physiological angiogenesis, as observed in wound healing, as well as pathological angiogenesis, such as in tumors. So at Regeneron, we developed a fusion protein called VEGF-TRAP, or a flibercept, which is composed of the VEGF binding domains from VEGF receptor 1 and VEGF receptor 2 fused to an IgG-FC portion. And the way a flibercept works is by binding VEGF and preventing it from binding to and signaling through VEGFR2 and thereby inhibiting angiogenesis. And we observed that VEGF blockade using a flibercept resulted in inhibition of tumor angiogenesis and tumor growth in preclinical as well as clinical settings where a flibercept in combination with chemotherapy is currently approved to treat metastatic colorectal cancer. In our preclinical studies, we utilized microultrasound in two distinct ways to assess the effects of a flibercept on tumors. So first, our attempts to identify biomarkers First, in our attempt to identify biomarkers predictive of efficacy of anti-VEGF therapies, we assessed various early changes, including tumor perfusion using contrast-enhanced microultrasound, and determined if those changes correlate with long-term tumor growth effects. Second, we utilized image-guided implantation to establish an orthotopic colorectal carcinoma liver metastasis model and monitor the effects of VEGF blockade on intrahepatic tumor growth. I'll start out by talking about the first set of studies. As I mentioned before, VEGF blockade results in the inhibition of tumor angiogenesis and decreased tumor growth. However, not all tumors respond equally well to anti-VEGF therapy and efforts were made to identify early response biomarkers that correlate with long-term efficacy, but the identification of those biomarkers has proven quite difficult, partly because the functional effects of VEGF blockade on tumor vessels is still partially unclear. We therefore assessed rapid molecular, morphologic, and functional vascular responses following the treatment with a flibercept to determine which parameters could assist in predicting long-term tumor growth response. For those efforts, we utilized tumor models with a range of responses to VEGF blockade. As indicated by the growth curves at the bottom of the slide, specifically, we utilized sensitive COLO205 tumors, moderately responsive C6 tumors, and resistant HT1080 tumors for our preclinical studies. So in these three tumor models, we assessed vessel density changes 8, 24, and 72 hours post a flibercept treatment to determine if vessel density changes correlate with tumor growth response. And as you can see in the representative images of tumor sections treated for 24 hours with control protein or a flibercept, as well as the quantitative assessment of vessel density over time in response to a flibercept, decreases in vessel density occurred in all three tumor types, suggesting that early changes in vessel density do not correspond with long-term tumor growth responses to a flibercept and are therefore not predictive. In addition to studying vessel density changes, we also took a broader approach by assessing gene expression changes at 8, 24, and 72 hours post a flibercept treatment by microarray. Interestingly, we observed two phases of gene expression changes, which were verified by TACMAN. One set of genes decreased in expression at 8 hours post-treatment and subsequently remained low. Examples for these Acute genes are KCNE3, ESM1, and nitrogen 2 The other set of genes decreased in expression in a delayed fashion, meaning by 24 or 72 hours post of flibercept treatment. And examples for these delayed genes are TI1, Cadherin5, and Robo4. However, changes in both acute and delayed genes occur in all three tumor types, and therefore 
They don't really correspond with long-term tumor growth effects of a flibercept. Interestingly, though, we observed that the expression changes of the delayed genes correlates really nicely with vessel density changes assessed by immunohistochemistry, and we conclude that these delayed gene expression changes can be used as markers for microvessel density in tumors treated with a flibercept. However, since neither the changes in delayed gene expression nor changes in microvessel density correlate with long-term tumor growth response, these two measurements cannot be used as predictive biomarkers. So in addition to assessing morphological changes, we were also interested in functional changes of the vasculature after a flibercept treatment. And these changes would be reflected as changes in vessel perfusion. As you probably know, microultrasound has a resolution limit of 30 micrometers, which does not allow the assessment of small vessels. However, this re resolution limit can be overcome by the use of a contrast agent called microbubbles. And microbubbles are gas-filled lipid shell spheres with a diameter of two to three micrometers, which makes them similar to size as well as behavior to an erythrocyte or a red blood cell. The uh, contrast agent is administered intravenously, and due to its gaseous core and the strong reflection of sound, it's easily detected by ultrasound. An example of a contrast-enhanced image showing a, uh, a tumor is shown on the right side of the slide. So the use of microbubbles allows the visualization of the microcirculation and thereby allows quantification of perfusion. Just to provide you with some more information, um, I listed the imaging parameters we used on the left of the slide. We found that the contrast gain, frame rate, and dynamic range should be optimized for each tumor type and then kept constant for all subsequent experiments using this particular tumor type. In the middle of the slide, I am showing you a contrast-enhanced image of a tumor cross-section prior to contrast agent up on top, where the tumor shows up as an almost entirely black um, area, while the overlying skin shows some, shows some unspecific signal. And in, in addition, I'm showing an image of the same tumor after contrast agent injection in the bottom. So when assessing tumor perfusion, we acquire a time intensity curve, as shown on the right, that provides the ratio between the steady state and uh, baseline intensity. And that ratio reflects the relative blood volume as a readout for perfusion. And that's what we use um, to quantify perfusion or perfusion changes. Utilizing contrast-enhanced microultrasound, we determined perfusion of the three different tumor types when treated with control agent or a flibercept for 24 hours. We observed decreased perfusion 24 hours after a flibercept treatment in the sensitive COLO205 tumors and the moderately responsive C6 tumors, but not in a flibercept-resistant HT1080 tumors. So these data suggest that early changes in perfusion correspond to long-term tumor growth response, which means that perfusion changes could be used as an early predictor of treatment efficacy. So to confirm the perfusion changes we observed by contrast-enhanced microultrasound by uh, using an in independent method, we labeled the functional vasculature in tumors using a fluorescently conjugated lectin, or FITSI lectin, which binds to the luminal portion of endothelial cells that compose the functional vasculature. We subsequently dissociated the tissues and labeled all endothelial cells using an anti-CD31 antibody, and we then determined the ratio of perfused fitzelectin positive and non-functional fitzelectin negative endothelial cells by flow cytometry, and that's shown here. For reference, as shown by the two bars on the far right, Endothelial cells from normal skin comprise approximately 1.9% of all skin cells, 
and we observed that 96% of these endothelial cells in normal skin were labeled by fitzelectin, meaning that they are derived from functional perfused um, vessels, as you would expect in the skin. When analyzing endothelial cells from tumors in that fashion, we found that overall C6 tumors had fewer endothelial cells than HT1080 tumors, as indicated by the overall height of the uh, control treated bars. In both tumors, a flibercept treatment resulted in a decrease in endothelial cells, which is in agreement with our immunohistochemistry vessel density data shown previously. The observed decrease in endothelial cell numbers was 37% in C6 tumors and 28% in HT1080 tumors. Interestingly, when we compare the number of endothelial cells from functional vessels, shown as the dark portion of the bars here, a decrease is only observed in the aflibercept-treated C6 tumors compared to the control-treated tumors, while aflibercept treatment did not decrease the number of endothelial cells from functional vessels in HT1080 tumors. So these data suggest that in resistant tumors, such as HT1080, a flibercept treatment only decreased the number of non-functional vessels while targeting both non-functional and functional vessels in moderately responsive tumors, such as C6 tumors. So, since a decrease in perfusion results in decreased oxygen delivery to the tumor tissue, we next examined the occurrence of hypoxia. We determined hypoxia based on immunohistochemistry staining of pimonidazole, a hypoxia marker, and observed an increase in hypoxia in a flibercept sensitive colo 205 and moderately responsive C6 tumors, both of which also show a decrease in perfusion 24 hours post a flibercept treatment. To the contrary, HT1080 tumors did not show any hypoxia, a result that corresponds with the observation of no change in perfusion. So these data further confirm that early changes in perfusion and hypoxia correspond to long-term tumor growth response of colo 5 C6, and HT1080 tumors. To Assess if early perfusion changes reliably predict long-term tumor growth um, response, we extended our efforts to additional tumors. In total, we tested six tumors for microvessel density and eight tumors, one of which in immunocompromised and in immunocompetent mice for early perfusion changes, and then correlated those results with long-term tumor growth inhibition. The uh, correlation between long-term tumor growth and um, perfusion shown in the bottom graph was very good as indicated by an R-square value of 0.73, with one being a perfect correlation, while the uh, correlation between long-term tumor growth inhibition and microvessel density shown in the top graph was very poor with an R-square value of 0.09. So these data indicate that early changes in um, perfusion of a flibercept treated tumors is predictive or appears to be predictive of long-term tumor growth inhibition. So in summary, we studied three tumor xenografts with different responses to a flibercept, and uh, a flibercept treatment decreased microvessel density in all three tumors and resulted in similar gene expression changes, neither of which correlated with long-term tumor growth inhibition. To the contrary, early changes in perfusion and hypoxia did occur in sensitive and moderately responsive tumors, but not in aflibercept-resistant tumors. And when we extended our, those studies to additional tumors, we observed that, again, perfusion changes, but not changes in microvessel density, correlated with long-term tumor growth inhibition. So taken together, these data show that contrast-enhanced ultrasound imaging allows us to identify perfusion changes as a predictor 
of a flibrocept response in xenograft tumors. I will now switch gears and speak about the second set of studies we did using microultrasound imaging. For these studies, we utilized image-guided implantation to establish an orthotopic colorectal carcinoma liver metastasis model and monitor the effect of VEGF blockade on intrahepatic tumor growth. Just to give you a little bit of background, um, colorectal cancer is the second leading cause of cancer-related death in the United States, and it often leads to metastatic disease frequently in the liver. The uh, current standard of care is a combination treatment of chemotherapeutics with anti-VEGF or anti-EGFR agents, resulting in a median survival of less than two years. We observed that in a clinical trial of a flibrocept plus chemo in patients with metastatic colorectal cancer, an increased overall survival and progression-free survival um, occurred in patients that had liver-only metastases. Um, on a different note, two prominent studies in preclinical models suggested that VEGF inhibition increased tumor invasiveness and metastasis. So to better understand the pharmacological activity of a flibrocept in metastatic colorectal cancer, we aimed to develop an orthotopic or pseudo-orthotopic metastatic intrahepatic colorectal cancer tumor model and utilize this model to assess the effects of a flibrocept on intrahepatic colorectal cancer tumor growth, angiogenesis, and invasion. Before showing you data, I'll briefly speak about the anatomy of the mouse um, abdominal organs and specifically the liver. So as you can see, the mouse has four liver lobes of which the left liver lobe is the biggest and we chose the left liver lobe for our tumor cell implantations because it is the biggest and we wanna keep the uh, tumor implantation site as consistent as possible. So, Various organs and structures in the abdomen, such as the liver, the portal vein, the pancreas, the aorta, and so on and on, can be visualized by ultrasound imaging in brightness or B mode, which is a two-dimensional ultrasound image composed of bright dots representing the ultrasound echoes. And the differentiation of various structures and organs is based on the fact that each structure has a distinctive appearance in a B mode image. So now that I've introduced B-mode ultrasound imaging, I will tell you how we can employ this method in our research. Published reports on liver metastasis models use surgical methods to implant cells into the liver. Since we have the Vivo 2100 micro ultrasound system in-house, which is equipped with an injection mount shown in the image on the left, we decided to utilize image-guided implantation rather than surgical implantation. So image-guided implantation is technically very challenging, but it has advantages over surgical implantation, the biggest advantage being that the body cavity of the animal is not open, and that re dramatically reduces the risk of infection. The image on the right shows a cross 2D cross-section of skin, liver tissue, and stomach as well as the needle that was entered into the liver parenchyma for implantation. And just as a side note, in order to see the liver or the, the liver, the needle in a B mode image, it has to be the needle has to be perpendicular to the transducer. So that alone is already a little bit of uh, finagling before you can even do the injection. So we successfully implanted HCT116 tumor cells into the liver using image-guided implantation, and we then characterized tumor growth kinetics by monitoring tumor growth using microultrasound as well as bioluminescence imaging, which was possible since our tumor cells were engineered to express luciferase. As for the microultrasound liver tumor size measure measurements, we determined both 2D and 3D tumor size, so in millimeter square and millimeter cube, 
But since the data correspond nicely, we decided to focus on 2D tumor size measurements for simplicity and for time considerations. And that's why um, the tumor growth is displayed in millimeter square. Just to give you an idea what a colorectal cancer tumor in the liver looks like when assessed by microultrasound, I added an image in the upper right corner where you can see an HCT116 tumor in the liver parenchyma. So it's this darker, roundish area with a T in the middle of it. So if liver cell treatment inhibited tumor growth as evidenced by both microultrasound as well as bioluminescent imaging 14 days post-treatment start. This delay in tumor growth in aflibercept-treated tumors was due to decreased proliferation, and that was assessed by immunohistochemistry where we detected the uh, proliferation marker KI67. In addition, aflibercept treatment decreased microvessel density as was determined by immunohistochemistry, detecting the vascular marker CD31. So we know that if liver cell treatment successfully targets the tumor vasculature in our intrahepatic HCT116 tumors, and that appears to result in tumor growth inhibition. As mentioned before, two studies um, a couple of years ago in 2009 in very high-profile journals um, suggested that anti-VEGF therapies can increase tumor invasiveness and metastasis in preclinical models. And based on these publications, we aimed to investigate if a flibrocep treatment um, increased the invasive potential of intrahepatic HCT116 tumors. So to address this, we adapted the clinical grading method to assess the invasive potential in our model. So in the clinic, the entire tumor liver border is assessed for different grades present, and then the highest grade identified along the border is reported. So in this cartoon example, that would be grade three. In our non-clinical grading system, the entire tumor liver border is assessed and is then reported as a percent um, area percentage of all grades present along the border. And this gives us a better readout as to possible changes in invasiveness after flibrocep treatment. The grades are described below and closely represent or resemble the different grades used in the clinical grading system. Grade one shows that the tumor liver border is clearly defined with little or no invasion and compression of hepatocytes by the tumor mass. Grade 2 shows a clearly defined tumor liver border with a less expansile tumor mass, as indicated by tumor cells invading in clusters. And grade 3 shows a poorly defined tumor liver border with tumor cells invading as cords and entrapping hepatocytes between them. Using this modified grading system, we analyzed the tumor liver border of intrahepatic HCT116 tumors at the end of study, which in this case was 14 days post-treatment start. We observed that a flibrocept treatment did not alter the overall clinical grade of HCT116 tumors, which would be the grade three in both treatment arms. However, a flibrocept treatment resulted in a shift to more grade two and less grade three compared to control treated tumors. So taken together, our data show that if liver cell does not increase the invasive potential of intrahepatic, intrahepatically grown um, HCT116 tumors. So in summary, we were able to utilize microultrasound image guided implantation for tumor cell implantation into the liver. Intrahepatic tumor growth was monitored by microultrasound as well as bioluminescence, and a flibrocept treatment delayed HCT116 intrahepatic tumor growth and decreased angiogenesis, but it did not increase the invasive potential of HCT116 tumors. Taken together, non-invasive microultrasound imaging allowed us to non-surgically implant tumor cells 
in the liver and assess effects of VEGF blockade on tumor growth. So, in conclusion, contrast-enhanced microultrasound imaging allowed us to identify perfusion changes as a predictor of a flibrocept response in xenograft tumors, and non-invasive microultrasound imaging allowed us to non-surgically implant tumor cells in the liver and assess effects of VEGF blockade. Hi, Alexander. Well, that's that's a great presentation. We were, we're going on to the very um, last slide, and at this at this point, if uh, there are any questions, please send it uh, send it your way. I have a few questions for you, Alexander, from the from the audience. Um, actually, at least uh, about eight of them. One of them was: um, Is are these tumors the the first part of the tumors that you were talking about, uh, the colorectal ones? Uh, were they subcutaneous or orthotopic? In the first part? Yeah. Um, there were subcutaneous tumors, which There's, makes uh -huh. them easier to image, and I think um, it also makes it easier to image perfusion changes because the liver is such a highly perfused um, organ that it would probably be quite difficult to measure perfusion in the liver. Absolutely. Um, along those lines, with the with the technique, um, the methodology that you used uh, to set up this experiment with contrast enhanced ultrasound, um, along those lines, the question was, um, did you did you use three dimensional? Um, did you try doing three dimensional um, calculation for contrast enhanced ultrasound uh, uh, parameters? Yes, we did. So we actually did both. We went through quite a bit of effort and compared the the 3D measurements to the 2D measurements. And since the trends or the the the, the changes um, or the slopes of the changes were similar, very similar actually, um, we for time considerations decided to go with the 2D um, analysis. Absolutely, and this was this was the case. Uh, so, uh, just to put put it into a context for the audience, um, Alexander showed us the curve intens the intensity graph, and uh, she mentioned uh, what you what you're saying is the slope of that graph uh, did not change whether you did 2D or 3D. Is that right? Yeah. So the slope was similar, and uh, the, uh, the the ratio with slightly different measurements. If you do it different analysis if you do it in 3D, but yeah, so the changes we saw were very, very comparable. Okay. And it seems okay. fair to use the uh, the largest cross-section of a subcutaneous tumor, which grows really nicely as a sphere for the most part. Um, so it, it's okay to use that um, as a representative. Absolutely. And along the same lines on, on the methodology for calculation, um, these tumors obviously are heterogeneous. Uh, was there any logic in what section of the tumor you chose to perform your um, assessment with the contrast? Is it the, lo is it the longest or the widest section, or was there any other rationale in choosing what section to um, perform your assessment? So yes, um, the tumors are definitely quite heterogeneous or can be, um, and we found we basically look at the largest cross section of the entire tumor, and we find that that kind of is a good representation of the um, of all the different um, aspects of the tumor, and it seems to it seems the most fair. So it seems to kind of average itself out. Absolutely. I mean, this is this obviously uh, what you're saying is it is dependent on the tumor, and it's uh, it is a, it is left to the user's discretion to make that uh, make that uh, make that decision and uh, keeping in mind the science behind it. Correct? Yes, that's correct. But if you think about it, if you have a tumor that's necrotic in the center and you have perfusion just on on like close to the to the uh, periphery or in the periphery of the tumor. 
if you don't use, if you don't look at, at a fair cross-section and you, you look too far to one side, you would get an over-representation of, of uh, perfusion. Absolutely. You, right. The next question asks, um, the perfusion quantification is derived from vessel density, but do these correlate with tumor growth inhibition? It appeared not to correlate with tumor growth inhibition. Would you be able to explain, explain that? Can you ask the question again? I'm not sure I caught that one. Sure. The, the question is from the audience. How quantitative are the perfusion measurements, and what is the dynamic range of this measurement? Um, upon explaining that, uh, the, uh, the question further goes on that perfusion is derived from vessel density. But perhaps in your study, and I'm not sure which slide, but it indicates that uh, while the perfusion is affected, it does not correlate with tumor growth inhibition in the tumor model. Um, could you explain? Yes, so I think one has to bear in mind that the tumor vasculature is quite unusual. So in normal organs, if you do have a blood vessel, it's classically perfused. That's not the case in tumors. The, the, the vessels are very, very abnormal, they're quite tortuous, Oftentimes they're not properly perfused, or you get these shutoffs of certain areas of vessels. Um, so that's why we think, um, or that's why I think we, we see this difference. Because if you if you look at microvessel density, you have you basically using CD31 as a marker, a pan endothelial cell marker. You're basically labeling all endothelial cells, and you have no way of knowing whether that vessel that you're seeing actually had flow going through it or not. Whereas when you look at perfusion, you're exclusively looking at the perfused vessels. And I think that's where the discrepancy comes in between one being um, predictive and the other one not. Absolutely. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think, uh, and you know, if there are follow-up to that questions, we will, you will be, um, we can approach you and direct those questions to you, right, Alexandra? Yes, yes, of course. Okay. Um, along, uh, along the lines of that question, I think you brought up an important point um, that what CD31 stain uh, represents in terms of information and what the dynamic contrast enhanced imaging uh, represents are two different pieces of information, correct? Yes, so the two pieces of information both retaining, pertaining to the, um, to the vasculature, and I think they're very nicely complementary. So I'm not saying that one is necessarily better than the other. I think they, both methods definitely allow to ask certain questions. And um, I think they, they complement each other very nicely and give us some more information rather than just looking at one. Absolutely. Um, the question here uh, with re regards to uh, clinical um, use of aflabercept, it, it is used clinically with chemothera uh, ke uh, chemotherapy. Have any experiments been done combining the two experiments, uh, two treatments? Um, we're definitely looking into that. Um, a follow-up question from, with respect to uh, contrast-enhanced Sorry, uh, with with your image guided injections, uh, when did did you get any leakage of tumor cells during guided injections? Yes, so sometimes we do. It's as I mentioned briefly. It's technically very very challenging, and um, and um, we actually implant these tumor cells with matrigel, and when so the needle is being inserted into the liver. And the tumor cells are you know, mixed with matrigel, mixed in matrigel. You inject, and then we leave the needle in for a couple of more moments to give the matrigel a chance to at least start to polymerize and solidify to minimize leakage. But you do sometimes get um, leakage where you know the tumor cells are not just localized to the liver, and they leak out and seed throughout the body cavity. Absolutely. All right, uh, we, will, we will have one last question. Um, were, were there any other tumor models that were being used for, um, for the study, like any transgenic models that you know of, or have you guys done it um, yourself? You mean for the intrahepatic model? Um, both of them. 
Um, we have not used um, transgenic models yet. Okay, so uh, no no tan models yet. Okay, uh, but I think it is plausible to do uh, to follow up similar tumors in transgenic mice. Correct. Well, I would assume so. It, as, as mentioned before, it depends a little bit on whether you want to look at perfusion changes and how well perfused the organ is that this transgenic animal would have the tumor in. Right, absolutely. Um, okay, we are going to move forward with uh, some updates. And um, as, as we see, uh, we're getting, um, we're about 10 minutes into, 10 minutes to uh, closing. Um, uh, Alexandra, great presentation. Uh, it provided us some um, insight, it would provide us insight into uh, your work in the first part of the, uh, of the talk, which is, pub which is uh, a published paper. Um, and we are more than happy to, on behalf of Alexandra to uh, provide you links. Uh, please email us. Um, at info at visualsonics.com uh, for that information. Um, as we reminded you earlier that uh, there will be a recording uh, provided for you uh, and feel free to follow us up. We will provide, uh, we will follow up with Alexandra on that. Uh, with respect to update, we would like to bring to your attention uh, the recent paper by Gerling et al. from Karolinska uh, Institute in Sweden. Uh, this paper shows simultaneous imaging of angiogenesis and hypoxia. Uh, it, this is uh, pretty much in line with um, with work uh, with, with the first part of the talk. Here we are presenting you the orthotopic pancreas cancer model showing um, showing the con contrast enhanced image right here um, and you can see two regions one in uh, yellow one in green and uh, the red uh, the red mapping shows you that there is high perfusion in the yellow region and uh, green uh, the green region is low in perfusion that is also mapped in the time intensity curve uh, graph that you see here similar to what Alexandra showed to you um, it, what's interesting is that this very same, these two regions, was also presented with oxygen saturation maps. Uh, so by clicking uh, a second button called photoacoustic mode, you can map the oxygen saturation for the two regions, in, one in uh, the, the yellow region and the green region. And it, it appears that from this, at least from this study, that the region that had uh, low perfusion, as shown by the time intensity curve here, also presents with um, a low oxygenation as shown by the um, blue color uh, or blue colors uh, map. Uh, interestingly, uh, this group uh, also provided in that same publication uh, histological validation. Uh, here they're presenting a, a subcutaneous pancreatic tumor shown in ultrasound mode here and its corresponding oxygen saturation map. Uh, what's important to note in, from this paper is that they stand for PIMO, a clinical uh, mark, uh, clinically used marker for hypoxia. The brown staining shown out here for PIMO coincides with the region where there is a uh, uh, presence of tumor cells. Um, they went on further on to uh, map or graph oxygen saturation, uh, plot oxygen saturation on the x-axis and CD, uh, sorry, PIMO staining on the y-axis, and uh, they show uh, the graph shows a linear correlation between um, PIMO staining and uh, hypoxia shown by oxygen saturation in these tumors. We wanted to bring this to your attention because um, uh, Alexandra did show in her uh, in her work whether she's using CD31 stain, um, also hypoxia stain for PIMO in the context of a a product that's going, uh, that's being used clinically. We thought this would be advantageous for you to know uh, new publications uh, with uh, with updates in, uh, in using um, contrast enhanced ultrasound and photoacoustics on on the same model at the same time. All right. Um, next steps for those of you uh, interested in where you go forward with this, of course, uh, feel free to provide us with uh, your questions. Um, Visit our visualsonics.com uh, webinars. The, ne the last month was uh, part one, imaging angiogenesis, in um, looking at inflammation. 
in the colon. And, this, and the next one coming up is image-guided investigation in drug development with a focus on cancer drug development. Uh, we will be also, uh, we'll be also uh, if you're visiting us, uh, you can see us at ATVB, which is a vascular biology conference in Toronto, or um, uh, visit us at World Pharma Congress, uh, May 21st to 22nd. Uh, as a matter of fact, Alexandra is uh, our invited uh, guest speaker at this conference, and she will be sharing uh, her findings uh, uh, at this conference. Um, as, as always, we're all scientists. We like to share our research. Uh, feel free to uh, become a Vivo ambassador. All you have to do is send your abstract. At this point, I'd like to extend um, our invitation to Alexandra uh, to be a Vivo ambassador uh, as, a, as, uh, as you have presented uh, our work. We have quite a number of questions and uh, uh, with respect to your science, Alexandra, we would love uh, to see if you can answer some of these questions as follow-up, if that's okay with you. Yes, of course, that's okay. All right. I, I know we have finished it early. We uh, had an interesting uh, seminar, and uh, thanks for taking the time out of your schedule, Alexandra, for providing us an informative session on um, using contrast-enhanced ultrasound imaging both uh, to establish liver uh, metastasis model and uh, to address efficacy uh, in the uh, cancer drug that's going, that is clinically available. We'd like to thank you all for your attention and uh, we will close off early. Uh, however, we would like to see you guys um, again for our May webinar on image-guided investigation in drug development. Thank you all.